from SUNY Cortland. In 1993, her associate's degree in applied science from ESF Rangers School in 1999 and her master's degree from ESF in 2004. She has worked as a research assistant on the American Chestnut Research and Restoration Project at ESL, ESF for four years while pursuing her master's degree and was promoted to a lab manager of the Plant to Issue Culture Lab in 2004. She assisted teach the plant tissue culture course at ESF for 11 years and became sole instructor for when her boss retired from teaching in 2015. She's the first author of two publications about transforming the American chestnut. She is a co-author of on 14 other publications and a member of the New York State chapter, chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation and a board member for the, of the American Chestnut Foundation Promotion and Outreach Committee, vice president of the Friends of Boone Library, ESF, and editor of the New York State chapter of American Chestnut Foundation newsletter, The Burr. I am pleased to welcome. Hi, I'm Linda McGuigan. Uh, I work at SUNY ESF, which is in Syracuse, New York. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the American Chestnut project that we do there in Syracuse. Um, thank you for inviting me here to speak about it. Um, the American Chestnut Research and Restoration Project started in uh, 1990. Um, we were approached by the New York chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation uh, and asked if we could do uh, try genetic engineering with American Chestnut. Um, the project was started uh, by uh, with Dr. William Powell and Dr. Chuck Maynard. Um, they were the co-directors. Chuck retired about, this is a picture of Chuck. He retired about five years ago. Um, and there is a new director or assistant director, Dr. Andrew Newhouse. Um, this is the current staff and students who are involved in the project. We've had over a hundred people working on the project through the years, probably closer to 200 at this point. The years probably closer to 200. Um, so, American chestnut is important because it was food American for wildlife. Was I'm getting feedback from the feed Is everybody muted? No, I hear myself. Okay, I'll keep talking. Um, <laughs> you can hear me. All right, can everybody on Zoom hear me? Thank you. Okay, so American chestnut was important for wildlife. Um, it gave a consistent mass crop year after year unlike um, something like oak, which could vary from year to year. Um, uh -oh. Okay, there we go. Um, it, uh, chestnut was good for agriculture. You can make chestnut beer, chestnut liqueur. You can use it in ice cream, uh, stews. It was just, it's a very nutritious um, food product. Um, the wood was used for uh, old barns. I have people tell me, oh, I have an old barn. It was made of chestnut wood and it's still surviving. It's 100 years old. Um, the wood is rot resistant. So because of that, they used it for telephone poles and railroad ties. The chestnut had a lot of tannins in it. So the leather industry relied upon chestnut for tanning, tanning the leather. Um, in 1915, uh, the first dean of ESF, Environmental Science and uh, College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, um, 
he wrote that it is claimed that in certain districts, the farmers realize more income from the sale of chestnuts than all other farm products. And this is wild chestnuts, not even chestnuts in orchards. So it was definitely depended upon to have this chestnut as a source of income. Um, there were street vendors that would sell them. The tree would get very big. Um, it was usually about five or six feet in diameter, but it could reach up to 10 feet in diameter. The tree was about, it could get to 80 to 100 feet tall. They were called the redwoods of the east because they were so big and massive. So this is a painting that was done of a chestnut tree and the people in it um, are going out chestnutting. They're going out to collect the nuts. You can see up on top, somebody had climbed the tree and was throwing down the nuts. Um, I wouldn't want to be at the bottom. Um, hold on a second for the Zoom people. These are, I don't know if you can see this. This is the burr that the nuts come in and they are very spiky and hurt if you're not careful. So you wouldn't want to be on the bottom side of that. So what happened was in 1904, it was discovered in the Bronx Zoological um, Park in New York City. So that's the Bronx Zoo and Bronx Botanical Garden right now, um, that some trees were dead or dying and it was caused by chestnut blight. People were horrified. They, they were upset that all these trees were dying. Uh, chestnut blight is caused by a fungus, Cryphonectria parasitica. And the way it works is it gets into a wound in the tree. It can't, it can't affect the tree unless there's a wound or, or some scratch. So it will get in that wound and it will start spreading. It spreads its mycelial fans around the tree and the, it will start secreting an acid, um, oxalic acid and the acid lowers the pH of the wood from around 5.5 down all the way to about 2.3. And then the fungus can eat off this dead wood. This is the chestnuts range, the natural range. Um, like I said before, it was discovered in 1904 in the Bronx Zoological Park. It was imported before then, so they think around 1878 is when it was thought that Japanese chestnut came into Queens, a nurseryman had um, gotten this and it spread from there. Within 50 years, all the trees in the rains were either dead or dying. Um, so it goes all the way up into Maine, down into Alabama, Mississippi. Uh, it's estimated that three to four billion trees were killed some areas in the range were a little more dense with trees and some were less dense. So some areas may have had up to 75% of the trees being chestnut. So very devastating when all the trees died. The fungus can live on other um, species of the Castania uh, genus. So chestnut, American chestnut is Castania dentata. It can also live on um, and kill chinkapins, which um, include the Allegheny and Ozark chinkapins. The fungus will also live on oaks. So even though it doesn't kill them, it can still survive on them. The fungus doesn't affect the root system. It, it can't kill the tree below ground for some reason. We think that there's just too many microbes in the soil to keep the fungus from overpowering the tree. Um, because of this, what will happen is the tree will die uh, above the, the ground and above the canker. And the tree produces sprouts underneath the canker. And these sprouts can actually grow really quickly. Um, as long as the root system is, uh, the roots are, are um, healthy, 
the tree can grow up to seven feet the first year after it sprouts. Um, subsequent years after that, I mean, it's seven years the first year, it may go to four year, four, seven feet the first year, may go to four feet after that, and then two feet, but it's still a pretty quick tree, growing tree. Um, unfortunately, because the fungus is still around, it will get into a wound in that new shoot, um, eventually that new, new uh, branch or trunk, and it will kill it back. It will die and then sprout again, and then the new sprouts will get the fungus. So it's like this Sisyphus-like Sisyphus cycle constantly going. Unfortunately, after 50, 60, 70 years, the tree is gonna run out of energy to keep producing sprouts. So what's gonna happen is it's not gonna be able to do it and it's gonna stop, it's gonna actually die the whole tree. There are some surviving trees in the woods and the best time to find them is in um, the summer around um, like June, early June. That's when they start flowering. And you can see in this photo, that's a chestnut tree flowering, these light yellow flowers. Um, <coughs> past efforts to fight the blight. They tried fungicides, which did not work. They tried sanitary methods, removing infected trees. So they would do like a break line. They would cut all the trees in a certain area to keep it from spreading. Um, unfortunately, I mentioned before that the fungus lives on oaks. So it crossed the line and because of the oaks and it was able to spread that way. Replacing American chestnut with non-native timber type Chinese chestnuts, an idea, but Chinese chestnuts, and I'll show you a picture in a little bit. Um, Chinese chestnuts are good, but they are not as tall as American chestnuts. Um, they look more like an orchard tree or an apple tree. You know, they branch out a lot more um, and the nuts are a lot larger. So, um, Wildlife such as birds wouldn't be able to eat the nuts because they're just too big. Um, so they actually tried a program where they did mutagenesis and they used radiation to try to uh, change the genome a little bit and see if the um, if, if they can get a resistant uh, chestnut tree. Uh, this did not work. Uh, I saw progeny from some of these trees and they looked horrible. <laughs> There's something called hypervirulence and this is a virus that actually uh, infects the fungus. Um, this works better in Europe than America uh, because there are less strains of the virus. So, or excuse me, less strains of the fungus. So, the virus will infect the fungus, the fungus will not be able to infect the tree, um, but for the virus to spread to other fun fungi, it would have to be compatible. And there's issues with compatibility. There's so many strains in um, of the fungus in America that it doesn't always work as well. <coughs> Species hybrid breeding. So, Another option is to take an American tree, breed it with a Chinese chestnut tree and uh, use the progeny, hope that it has enough of the Chinese genes to make it resistant to this fungus, um, but look like an American chestnut. This is about 50-50, you know, obviously it has half its genes from uh, one, one tree and half its genes from the other. So it doesn't, it's, it's, a, it's an option, it's not the best option. There's a back cross breeding program, which I'm going to talk about in the next slides, and that was started in 1983 by the um, the American Chestnut Foundation, and they actually um, cross uh, continuously cross back to an American tree, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment. So that that's something that's being worked on, and finally, genetic engineering, which is the program that I'm working on in Syracuse. 
and we are adding resistance genes to the genome. So here's uh, what the American Chestnut Foundation is doing. And their goal is to get a tree that has mostly American chestnut genes in it with the just a few genes that from Chinese chestnut that make it resistant to this blight. Um, so they start with an American and a Chinese, they breed it, take the progeny, they breed it to an American tree, they take the progeny, breed it back to another American tree, and then they interbreed them. Uh, so, so they continuously um, interbreed them until they get a tree that they start with half, half American, half Chinese, they get rid of the trees that have unwanted traits and they end up with a tree with 15 16 American chestnut uh, traits. This was started with the assumption that there are three or four genes in the Chinese chestnut that give it resistance to the blight. In 2019, Jared Westbrook at the American Chestnut Foundation did a study and found that there's actually about 12 genes that give Chinese chestnut resistant to the resistance to the blight. So this makes it a lot more complicated for this program. Um, so talk about their program and our program, a little bit of the differences. Um, they both have advantages and disadvantages. Um, so chestnut has about 3,000 gene pairs. 30,000, thank you. <laughs> 30,000. Um, so the, the American Chestnut Foundation's back cross breeding program would be incorporating 1 16th Chinese genes into that, into the um, genome. Chinese chestnuts short, uh, smaller than American chestnut. And I want to use this book as um, a comparison. So say you have a book that has 30,000 words in it in English. 11 pages or almost 3,000 words would be in Chinese if, if we did you know this 1 16th. So you'd be able to read the book, but there'd be some parts that you may not understand because it's in a different language. Um, so this passage from Henry David Thoreau's Walden or Life in the Woods said, it was very exciting at that season to roam the then boundless chestnut woods of Lincoln. The, trans, uh, the transgenics or the genetic engineering uh, program would make very small changes. We'd be adding two to four words to the, um, to the um, passage and we would change it to, it was very exciting <clears throat> at that season to roam the, the then boundless blight tolerant chestnut woods of Lincoln. Mm -hmm. It's gonna make the tree, it's, the tree is still gonna stay 100% American. We're just adding a few genes to make it resistant to this fungus. The gene that we're using is oxalate oxidase. It's from wheat, the one that we are using. It's found in other plants and fungi. It's non-gluten and non-allergen. Um, my boss has celiac disease and he is looking forward to being able to eat these knowing that it's not gonna um, have that, a, an effect on it because it's from wheat. Um, the way the gene works is it detoxifies the oxalic acid. So it converts that acid that the fungus is using to uh, lower the pH. It converts that acid into hydrogen peroxide and carbon dioxide. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't, it's not a pesticide. It doesn't kill the fungus. All it does is it converts the product. Um, because it's not harming the fungus, there's less selective pressure to overcome. 
and we're also going to be stacking it with other genes so that um, we can uh, increase the chances of it uh, working. Like I said uh, before, uh, oxalate oxidase is in foods that you that people eat all the time. If you had a tomato or banana, strawberries recently, um, then you had um, something with the oxalate oxidase gene. It's in a bunch of plants, wild and ornamental. It's in fungi and bacteria. So it's everywhere. Just think of it as a shield. We are putting a shield up for the uh, chestnut, protecting it from, from buster blight. <laughs> the method that we use to get the gene into the chestnut is called agrobacterium mediated transformation. Agrobacterium is a natural plant genetic engineer and actually sweet potatoes were, um, were genetically engineered by agro about 8,000 years ago. They've found traces of the bacterium in sweet potatoes. So we know that uh, it, it was done a while ago. Um, what happens is the agrobacterium lives in the soil around the roots of the plant. And agrobacterium has nuclear DNA, but it also has a piece of circular DNA called a uh, plasmid. And the agrobacterium will attach itself to the plant cell and transfer over a piece of this plasmid into the plant cell, which gets incorporated into the plant genome. And it fools the plant into producing food for the bacterium. So it produces these galls that have have food for the bacterium. Uh, scientists have figured out a way to disarm the bacterium and put in genes that, uh, the gene of interest that we want. So in our case, we put in the oxalate oxidase gene and that will get transferred over into the plant cell and we will have a blight tolerant American chestnut. The tissue that we use it, are embryos. So we use uh, chestnut embryos and we go to the field and collect wild type um, burrs from, from immature chestnuts. So around the end of July or beginning of August is when we'll start collecting them. And we'll open up the nut. And then in a process called plant tissue culture, we use a laminar flow hood. So it's this hood that blows out sterile air. So we don't have other microbes going around to contaminate anything. And we will bleach the nuts. We'll do a 50% bleach for like five minutes. And after that, we cut open the, the nut and we will extract the embryos. At this point, the chestnut have somewhere around nine to 12 embryos in it. As the chestnut matures, it will, one of the embryos will get bigger and the rest will get aborted. Um, but at this point, we're gonna be using all of the embryos that are still there. We put them in a sterile container, a Petri dish that has a medium in it, actually. These are, um, this is an example, actually, people on Zoom, I have an example. This is a Petri dish that has a medium of all the nutrients that the chestnuts need to grow. Um, I can pass this around if you're interested in looking at it. And some of them will die. Some of them will get contaminated. <coughs> And some of them will actually start growing an embryo off. So it starts with the zygotic embryo and then it will grow another embryo, which is called the somatic embryo. And this will continue to grow into more embryos. And these are all clonal. So they have all the same DNA. This will get cut up 
and divided. And then these will again start growing into uh, bigger clumps of embryos. They will again get divided. So this is how we get um, our tissue for the transformation. We take the embryos and we mix it with the agrobacterium, which has been growing in a nutrient medium. It's in liquid. So we add the liquid to, the, to a test tube. We add the um, embryos to the test tube. And then we put them on this um, rotating shaker. Uh, this is a movie, but I don't wanna run it because I heard it slows down on Zoom. It doesn't do well. So um, just imagine it going in a circle. <laughs> After being uh, put, mixed with the agrobacterium for an hour, the embryos are put onto a filter paper that's slightly moistened and placed in the dark for two days. This is when the agrobacterium is getting really close to the tissue and transferring its DNA. After that, it goes into a bioreactor. The bioreactor is just a container that has two different chambers. In this case, it's a lower chamber and an upper chamber. The upper chamber has a screen on it, so the embryos will go on the screen. And every, um, every six hours, a timer will, there's a timer that's set, and every six hours it will flood. So all that liquid medium on the bottom will go to the top. It will flood the tissue. In the medium is nutrients for the embryos to grow. It also has antibiotics that will kill off any of the agrobacterium, but it also has antibiotics that will kill off any tissue that is not transformed. After six to eight weeks, this goes back onto a medium that has um, nutrients in it. A lot of the tissue will be dead, and that's a good thing because that doesn't have the gene in it. Um, a lot of the tissue will be alive. And those are separate. We consider these all separate events and we keep them separate from each other. And what an event is, if you can see um, there's these green fluorescent dots on here and each one is a cell that has a gene that was put into it. This was um, this is a gene called green fluorescent protein. We don't use this. It was just a proof of concept when we were starting out. Uh, so one cell that has the gene in it, we call event one. Another cell we would call event two. Once these cells start growing and turning, growing into uh, new embryos, we separate them. I just want to show this picture. Um, so these would be three different cells, cell A, cell B, and cell C. Chestnut have 12 chromosomal pairs. Humans have 23. Um, so in cell A, if the gene went into chromosome seven, we would call that event one. If it goes into the fourth chromosome, um, we would call that event two. And then finally, the third cell may have had it put into chromosome one and chromosome eight, and that would be event three. So we want to keep these separate because if they're not, it, we want to keep them separate because the position it goes in may affect how much expression the, um, the gene is, is producing. So cell A may have more blight tolerance than cell B and cell C has more than one copy of the gene. So we don't wanna keep that. It makes it more difficult when we're breeding. So here, the, um, would be your left. The one on the left, the yellow -ish bar is showing the American chestnut expression. So it's normalized at one. Uh, there's two Chinese chestnuts uh, two clonal lines, one's Qing and one's Hong Kong, and they're in blue. They have a lot more expression. And then all the green are different transgenic events. 
And depending on where the gene went in the genome shows some are less than the Chinese and some are much more. So that's what we're looking for. And we have a way to test a relative expression. So once the gene gets into the genome, we, we, want, we don't want to have um, embryos anymore. We want to have shoots. So we regenerate them into little shoots here. We start out with small guys and then we grow them bigger. And that's what's in this container. So we have nutrient medium on the bottom. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, we can pass this around as well. So those are little trees just growing in that container, a whole bunch of little trees. How old are they? Mm -hmm. Well, we cut them back. So once a month, we cut the bottom off of them and take the little shoots and put them in fresh medium. So we start with a piece that's probably about half an inch tall. And that's what, about two weeks old, I think. Is that what we determined? Um, my boss referred to it the other day as a forest in a container or something like that. <laughs> it was very funny. Okay, so, and you can see it on the screen, just a little forest. We need to multiply that. And um, along the way, I forgot to mention, the embryos are tested by PCR. Um, there, we have a molecular lab and they'll check by PCR to make sure that the gene actually went into the genome and um, then they'll let me know it's okay to regenerate them. Once it, they're regenerated, I multiply them and then I send the shoots to the other lab again and they'll check to see how many copies are in the um, plant and they'll also check um, for relative expression. And we want high expression, low copy number, once they give me the okay, I will multiply them again and give them to a colleague who starts the rooting process. We cut off that little piece of callus at the bottom and callus is just undifferentiated cells. It's just um, cells that could turn into anything. Um, but at this point, we just wanna get rid of it. And then we dip it in a rooting hormone and produce roots. They're potted up and put into a growth chamber. Tissue cultured trees, the leaves on them don't have, um, they don't grow like leaves that are outside. Um, there's no reason for, the, they have little pores called stomata and these pores don't close in tissue culture because they don't need to. They also don't need the little waxy uh, layer, the cuticle, um, because they're growing in high humidity. So when we take these out of the cubes, they are not ready for the real world and they can desiccate very easily. So what we do is we put them in these growth chambers that have, the, we control the temperature, we control the lighting and we control the humidity. Um, we do not have 95% humidity the way we want, but it gets pretty high, maybe 80, 85%, and it keeps them alive long enough for them to produce real world leaves. And these <coughs> leaves can function normally. So once they get big enough, we'll put them in the greenhouse. And once spring rolls around, we can plant them outside in the field. This was our first transgenic tree ever planted. And I think you'll recognize that's Herb Darling. Um, he is the, pres the first president of the New York chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. This tree was planted in 2006. This was our version 1.0. So you have an iPhone, you, you get the next version and the next version and the next version when it gets better. This was our first version. It has the oxalate oxidase gene in it. There's something called a promoter. The promoter goes before the gene. The promoter is the switch that says turn on or turn off. 
the switch, the promoter in this specific version um, was partially deleted. So it has a little bit more tolerance to the fungus, but not enough. So it's still out in the field, it gets blighted, we cut it back down and then it'll grow new, new, shoot, um, new branches, new shoots. Um, our newest version, our Darling 58 tree is our 4.0. And this one has the oxalate oxidase gene with a very good promoter. It's a constituent promoter, which means it's on all the time. And uh, so it's always being expressed. Our next version, our 5.0 is uh, the oxalate oxidase gene with a wound inducible promoter. So we have that one too. And that one, um, the gene is only expressed when the tree is wounded. And when the tree is wounded is where the fungus gets in. So this, this is, you know, the next step up. The Darling 58, this one right here is the one that we're going through the regulatory process with through the government. So we're looking to get this one deregulated. Um, we turned in the paperwork and we're waiting to hear back from them. And I'll talk a little bit more about them in, in a little bit later. Um, so anyway, the Darling 58 is clonal. We don't want to hand out clonal lines because we don't want a monoculture. We want to take our transgenic American chestnut and we want to, uh, we want to um, breed it with other trees that, have, that are regionally adapted. So we're asking people to plant mother trees in their yards or on their property and once we have permission, they will get trans, a transgenic tree that they can breed with it. And this way we won't have um, this monoculture. Uh, we've been doing it on regulator, regulated orchards. Um, it's regulated by the government right now. And so we have, I think we're on our fourth generation so that we have a lot of genotypes. Because the gene that we're adding is only going into one of the chromosomes, one of the chromosomal pair, when we breed it, only half of the offspring are going to inherit this gene. And the other half will be um, just wild type. And this is good because if, in the future, if there's other methods of um, another method is discovered of um, making the tree resistant to this blight, we can uh, rescue the genotype, the original genotype without the transgene. We do have a way to test for the transgene. Um, we take a leaf, use a hole punch, punch it out, and there's a certain enzyme uh, or chemical that we can put it in. And if you see a black ring around it, that means it's transgenic. To get the pollen to do our uh, pollinations, we've figured out that we can put the trees in a highlight growth chamber. We stress the crap out of them. <laughs> and they're like, oh no, I'm, I'm not liking this. I need to produce a lot of pollen. So what they will do is produce pollen in these trees that are less than a year old. Normally, American chestnuts are three years old before they produce male catkins, male flowers. Um, it takes five to seven years for them to produce female flowers. A tree has both male and female flowers on it, but it doesn't self. So um, you do need two trees to get, uh, to get nuts. If you're interested in seeing our pollination workshop that we did virtual, um, you can go to this website and check it out. So to collect the pollen, so once we get the trees all stressed out and producing pollen uh, or catkins, uh, we'll take a slide and we'll rub the slide against the catkins until it collects a bunch of 
of the pollen and we can store these in these little containers in the freezer for about a up to a year. So all year round, we'll collect the pollen and have it ready for the summer. When the summer comes, I think around early June, uh, we have to go out and look for female flowers. And this is what it looks like when, we, when they start developing the female. So you can see that's the male flower up there. This is the male flower, but at the base is where you'll see, and I'll show you people on Zoom. So this is the, the male flower developing. This is the male flower. And at the base of the male flower, you'll see the female flowers developing. We wanna put a bag on this before um, they develop too far because we don't want other trees in the area to pollinate them. We want to pollinate it with our transgenic pollen. We go in a lift and we do the bagging. And then early or late June, early July, we go back out and we will use the pollen on the slides and we will pollinate them in the lift. And so it's just rubbing that slide against the female flower. Here's a close up of that. You can see some of the pollen um, on there. Oh, you guys can't see the, <laughs> I thought you could see the arrow that I was using. Um, okay, so in <coughs> October, we go out with a pole pruner and we cut down the bags. We also use a, a screen, a mesh screen bag to cover the white bag so that uh, squirrels don't get our nuts before we can. We, they're too important to us. The burrs are pretty spiky, so we use different methods to cut open the burrs and collect the nuts. Sometimes they open naturally, but if they open naturally, then um, well, not but. So sometimes they open naturally and we can gather the nuts that way, um, but sometimes we have to cut them open. <laughs> the first year that we used our transgenic pollen to um, do controlled pollinations, we got 16 seeds. The next year we got none. <laughs> the reason was we had a freeze or so we take the nuts and we store them in the refrigerator after we get them so they store over in the fridge for the winter and then we will plant them out the next year the refrigerator had a malfunction it got stuck in the cold position and froze everything so the lesson we learned was a never put all your nuts in one refrigerator so now we separate them and we also have a monitor on the, the one, the big refrigerator. So if anything happens, we get an email or a text message saying something's not right. The next year we got 485 <laughs> seeds and it started going up and then COVID hit. So we weren't allowed to have more than one person in a lift at a time. So that slowed us down and we, but we still good numbers. And then last year we got 1800 transgenic seeds that we are going to be planting out this summer, actually next month, this spring. Um, it's a lot of work. We have our whole crew go out there and do the planting. Um, Want to start talking about testing the, uh, the, the, the trees for uh, it's testing them to see how resistant they are, how tolerant they are to the blight. Um, one of the me early methods we use is a leaf assay. And this was developed by Andy Newhouse. And what he, what he does is he grows up the fungus in a Petri dish. He'll collect leaves from the transgenic trees and he'll put a little slice in the mid vein put the fungus on the mid vein, let it sit for a few days, and then he will measure how long the necrotic area, the dead area is, and 
we found that this correlates to how later on when we do testing, it, it gives us a very good representation of how blight tolerant the trees are, are gonna be. Um, we also do small stem assays. You can see in this image, um, the wild type is on your left. The Chinese chestnut is on the right. So the Chinese chestnut pretty much grew up with, you know, evolved with the blight in Asia because that's where the blight came from. Um, so the Chinese chestnut has a lot of tolerance to this blight. Uh, we compare, we, we cut little, um, we cut a little notch in the Chinese chestnut stem. We cut a little notch in the wild type American chestnut. And we did the same with the uh, transgenic chestnut. And if you can see, we wanted the same thickness of the stem. Sh the Chinese are shorter because they got thicker quicker. Um, but you can see the wild type after six weeks, they all wilted. Some of the Chinese chestnut wilted, but the transgenic are fine. This is a close up of what the stems look like. And you can see there's a sunken canker for the uh, non transgenic American chestnut, like this one. So it's sinking in, whereas the, um, the D58 stands for transgenic, that's our transgenic. Um, and the CC is Chinese chestnut and they're healing over. So, and the length of the uh, canker was a lot bigger in the non-transgenic. Uh, we did more testing on field grown trees and you can see same thing, the wild type American chestnut, horrible sunken canker, whereas the Chinese chestnut and the American chestnut uh, with the gene in it, are healing over. We wanted to make sure that this didn't affect any uh, other species. So we've done many tests with uh, soil fungi, the mycorrhizae. Um, we've tested it on tadpoles because tadpoles will be in vernal pools that may have chestnut leaves fall in it. Uh, the bumblebee pollen study. Um, so we've done many, many tests with other species just to make sure, and everything is tested fine. It doesn't seem to affect anything. We're going through the regulatory um, process right now with the government. We have to go through the USDA, the FDA, and the EPA. We submitted the paperwork, hundreds and hundreds of pages of, um, of work that we sent to them. And we finally received a response that they should be telling us by, um, I think August of 2023, we're gonna have a response and we're gonna know if we have non-regulatory status. So we're, we have about a little over a year and then we'll be able to hopefully um, distribute these trees. Um, some places that we want to give the trees is in, to do mine reclamation, uh, maybe some historic sites and private landowner sites. It's going to take a long time. These trees will need help to spread. Um, they only move at a rate of maybe one to two miles every hundred years, so it's not going to be done in my lifetime. <laughs> This can be a model for other threatened trees. Um, there's definitely a lot of other, uh, a lot of other diseases out there. Sudden oak death, um, you know, hemlock woolly adulted. We do have a, an American elm project going on. So we have a postdoc who's working with that and trying to um, transform elm with, genes to make it re resistant to the blight, to Dutch elm disease. Um, and last week, a colleague and I actually went to someone's house in 
collected some ash samples and we're trying to get that in tissue culture. Uh, if you're interested in helping, you can go to our website at esf.edu slash chestnut. We also have a Facebook group page that you can join and we're on Instagram. You can also join the New York chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation or just you can go to the American Chestnut Foundation website or you can even become a member of the New York chapter. And that's all I have. Wow. Okay. <laughs> wanted to show you this is um, a piece of American chestnut it's a cookie um, and then here the a district director for the New York chapter of the American chestnut foundation made this spoon and I wanted it so <laughs> I talked to him and I will pass him around it, it, it's a great one it's a lot lighter than you think Pass around the pocket knife. Oh, you want to touch this? Well, Absolutely. <laughs> if you're brave enough, I have two of them, but I'll just. When they're when it's immature, it's not as as spiky. It doesn't hurt as much, but yeah, these. That's because it's dried out. Yeah, it's it's dry and old. Here's the porcupine for those of you on Zoom. Um, are there any questions? Yeah. I have dust and chestnuts growing in the backyard now. How do they compare? Because I was told they're a hybrid. They are a hybrid. I'm trying to remember what is in Dustin. Um, they're out of Florida. Yeah. Yeah, um, they have the huge nuts, right? Big, yes. Yeah, so let me see if I can. Well, I was, you know, Oops. they were That's not to be I... a bit of blend of American. I was going to show you and I accidentally. You want to start sharing again? Can I do that again? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, There's a share screen. Later. And it was here. Okay, let's see if I can. Um... This is too sensitive for me. I'm sorry. Um, I will try to find this. I have a slide that I hid because I wasn't going to talk about it. I didn't know if I had enough time. I don't think it's this one. I think it's the next one. Ah. Yeah. So that's the dust, dun, dunstan, right? See, see the size? Yeah. They're huge compared to, so they're hybrids. And there's nothing wrong with a hybrid. It's just, if you have this poor little duck eating chestnuts, that's not going to fit in that. <laughs> um, Which are the ones that you buy in the store right now? Are they European? They're European. They're, a lot of the ones in the stores are from Italy. They have a huge um, chestnut. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> the European chestnuts are different. Um, they're similar. They're, there's a lot of similarities. They're, they're tall like American chestnuts. They're just a few little differences. Um, a lot of people who are chestnut connoisseurs say, say that American chestnuts are the sweetest out of all of them. So there's Japanese, Chinese, European, American. I think there's a Korean. So. And the Europeans don't get the blight? They do get the blight. They're just, they have the hypervirulence. So some of them are they have less strains of the blight, so they can use hypervirulence. Um, but yeah, there's actually uh, programs trying to save the European test nuts as well. We've got two test nuts that we got in 2010. 
um, through the Monroe County Soil and Water from the American Chestnut Foundation. Okay. And we can just plant them together. They're just sitting there and growing. They haven't done any nuts yet. Are we supposed to be doing anything with them, like pruning them or, or anything? <laughs> I don't know. They're just sitting there. So you have two. How big are they? And they haven't produced any flowers yet? Not that we've noticed. Okay. Yeah, because you uh, are they in the sunlight? Uh huh. They're in full sun. Huh. Like I may have planted them too close. They're probably about six or eight feet apart. Yeah, yeah that, the, that's that's a bit. People don't expect them to grow very long, so I mean, <laughs> they're just being looking down. So I figured we'd be lucky if they have three or four feet and they're three times that. Okay. Um, they, they've still got last year's dead leaves on, but I, I took up a couple of photos before we came over and they've got shoots. So they're starting to get this year's growth. Okay, um, interesting. Um, yeah, they should have been flowering by now. I'm not sure why not. You have pictures? Maybe after this, I, I can look at it after? Okay, sure. Yeah, I'd be interested. Um, there's another question. And I'm sorry to the people on Zoom, I should be repeating the question. I heard years ago that there were naturally resistant specimens of American chestnut around here, oh. actually the town of Greece. Really? There were several uh, growing. I mean, there was in Monroe County, New York, there were uh, several trees that were American chestnuts and naturally resistant. Uh, How do they know that they are naturally? So the question or the comment was that there's a uh, few chestnut trees in uh, Monroe County in Greece that are naturally resistant. Did, have they been tested to see if they're resistant or they just don't have the blight? They're on the blight. Okay. They're old trees. Oh, uh, I'd love to see them. <laughs> you can probably check with Monroe County. Uh, uh, soil and water. Yeah, soil and water or the egg, egg department or whatever. They might know where they are. There's, there's actually um, has been discussion about how there may have been naturally resistant chestnuts, but because they did all these break lines and were cutting trees down like wow. crazy, they may have cut some down. Um, I know in Canada, they didn't do that method and they think that they have some there that are also naturally resistant, but yeah, that, that would be interesting to find out. Is there a large group of them in Michigan? Um, I know Michigan has a program with chestnuts. Are you thinking of the oh, ones in really Salem, good. in Salem, Wisconsin? Because they had, they, before the blight in Salem, uh, Wisconsin, they had planted, I think a hundred, maybe more of these trees and they were huge. There, there was this big stand and they, they, they finally, probably 10, 20 years ago, started getting the blight and now it looks horrible. Yeah, it, it just even, I think there's a few trees in, I wanna say Oregon, that there were two huge trees that were like 180 to 100 feet tall. And I think that they're now, one of them had to be cut down. So I see there's stuff, there's chat. I don't know if I should. Um, there's some questions that come up here. Yeah. Okay, we hear you. Lots of people. Um, oh, you're welcome. Um, my brother just planted a chestnut tree from their just like property at Oh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what kind of trees. Um, But uh, I was just um, noticing, you know, it shows some hand-on work to get these things individually planted and then monitoring. Is there going to be a period at some point where they just naturally uh, spread? Like you said, it's, I think a hundred years. It's so for slow while. for the spread, but yeah. I mean, um, how, how big do they have to get so that they might just, um, you know, pollinate through? So they're wind pollinated for the most part. I think that, uh, you know, the, the pollen spreads through wind, wind. I think that there is, there's definitely some insect pollination, but a lot of it is mostly um, 
wind. I think, oh, I want to say 400 yards is the distance. We're actually doing a study to see how far pollen will, will spread um, because I don't think there's, there's no, there's some papers out there that have estimates, but nobody has a specific, you know, it's somewhere between like 400 and 1,000 yards, I think, or feet or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, my two are about 20 feet apart because that's what was suggested. Okay. And they both produce nuts. Oh, great. They're about seven years old. Yeah, that's, that sounds. When will your trees be, you're saying 2023, they'll be deregulated. Hopefully. <laughs> be deregulated. So when will that be a tree that would be in mind? So, um, yeah, we're expecting 2023 to be when we can distribute them. We have been planning for this. So we have been planting out in our fields. We have holding plots for chestnut trees um, for the past, oh, I don't know, I want to say like four or five years. So we have trees. You don't want them too big because then, you know, distributing them is going to be harder. Um, but again, we had 1,800 nuts last season. Hopefully we'll get more next or this season. Um, so we're trying to get like, we had, excuse me, we had a 10,000 chestnut tree um, uh, program going on where that's what we want to have available. I don't know if we'll quite get that number, but we're definitely working to have some for distribution when we're allowed to, but it's going to take a lot of people's help to, you know, increase that number. So if people plant mother trees and then they can pollinate them and they get nuts and they can hand the nuts out to people and eventually we'll work together to, to get this you know, out there. Linda, let's take this a different direction on that, that same response you just gave to Ken's question. <laughs> uh, and, and use your profession. What are the chances of rooted tissue culture or specimens that are, that are already showing resistance? You know, so... the numbers getting in the field rather than waiting for seedlings. Okay, so the question was, what are the chances of a plant tissue cultured uh, chestnut to be distributed because we can make a lot of shoots? Unfortunately, getting these chestnut trees out of tissue culture rooted in pots and out in the field, they do horrible. They grow slower, they grow gnarly. Um, it is not because they have the gene in it, it's because they're tissue cultured. So whether they have the, the oxalate oxidase gene or if they're just wild type, if we take them out of culture, the root to shoot connection isn't streamlined. So it they just do bad. So that's, we started with that approach and we were not getting very nice chestnuts out in the field. Um, some of them we were able to get big enough to get pollen from, and then we were able to get nuts. So that's what we're relying on now is the pollinations. I want so, a chance to take it another step of grafting it on the root stuff. We are doing grafting. Um, we do have a, a, one of my colleagues is the grafting expert, and he's able to do that. Um, yeah, that's another possibility. So. Is there any other questions? I see another. If we want to plant a mother tree, where is the best place to purchase one? Um, my suggestion if you want a mother tree is to talk to Alan Nichols. He is the president of the American Chestnut, the New York chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. Um, Let's see if I can get to that slide. It's all the way somewhere down here. Okay. 
So if you go to the first website, uh, AS, acf.org slash New York, um, it has his information. You can email him and ask him for nuts and he will, he's very good about distributing nuts. Um, he wants everybody to have a tree. I should just tell everybody that we record these sessions and they'll be available on our YouTube site, Nation Sun's YouTube site. So when you get home a couple of days from now, you can go to that and you can see these websites, these QR codes uh, on your laptop or PC to, to get to these different contacts. You're welcome. Well, this was fascinating. Oh. One more question. Okay, you said mother tree. Don't, don't you need two trees to produce? One? Right. So we're we're encouraging mother trees. So it takes five to seven years for a tree to produce female flowers. We want you to have a mother for when our our transgenics are available, and then you can use that as the father tree. Well, Linda, thank you for coming and doing this presentation. I think one of the more fascinating ones that we've seen, and it was interesting.